Welcome to episode six of You Need to Be Yourself, You Can't Be No One Else. I'm delighted to say that today's guest is Dr. Morris Collins. Morris is a consultant surgeon and the medical director and also team principal at the world-renowned Hair Restoration Clinic in Backrock in Dublin. I landed at Morris's door about 10 years ago because I began to feel this deep discontentment between the mind's eye version I had of myself and the man looking back in the mirror. What I thought was vanity was actually something much, much deeper. It was almost an existential crisis that went deep into how I saw myself, my self-esteem, confidence, and just about being comfortable and living in my own skin. That very crisis is something that affects men and women from every walk of life. We're talking bin men, psychologists, surgeons, doctors, nurses, actors, musicians, singers, singer, songwriters, civil servants, you name it. The image looking back at us from the mirror is a deeply, deeply powerful one. But why? Morris and I also got into how his passion for his work and his patience keeps him alive, that and a lifelong fascination with nutrition. And also how he hopes deadlifting 147 kg at 75 years of age is gonna to contribute to leaving a very unique legacy, being the fittest corpse in Dublin. I hope you get something from this chat. If you do, you know the deal. Hit like, hit subscribe, ping it on to someone who you think it might help. Huge thank you as always to Amy Time Productions for producing. So without further ado, this is episode six of You Need to Be Yourself, You Can't Be No One Else with Dr. Morris Collins. The question I've, I've had in my head since I've been a patient of yours for over 10 years and, and since I had the, the procedure myself, the question was running around in my head was, why is... Or why does the the man or the woman, their image they see in the mirror, that mind's eye version of ourselves, why does that have such a hold over us? It's, it's fascinating. I, I, I studied psychology when I was uh, doing medicine in UCD, but I've never done psychology after that. But um, when I took up hair transplantation, it was for my surgical skills that I went into the specialty. But it was only as time moved on that I realized there was such a strong psychological component to hair. And we all have a mental image of ourselves in our mind. And if the man in the mirror doesn't match that to a certain extent, then a discontent arises. It's not a vanity issue. A lot of people are misled by the concept that oh, I'm being very vain if I do something about it. And they feel guilty about it. But in fact, my opinion is that it's nothing to do with vanity or very little. Um, it's all about the image that we see of ourselves. Um, I don't know whether you've ever looked at uh, wedding photograph albums and with a family after the, the big event. And people say, oh, God, I don't look like that, do I? <laughs> but the camera never lies. You know, yeah. it, these are representations of themselves. But our, our own image of ourselves is unique to our psyche. And I think when you look in the mirror, you need to see something that resembles what you have in your mind. Now, it's, it's far more complex than that because, now, because I've done three hair transplants on blind men, uh, which I find intriguing. And um, one of them is a psychologist. And I asked him, why would a blind man have a hair transplant? He, he cracked up laughing. And he said, Morris, I hated the feel of my bald head. I couldn't see it, but I could feel it. And my fingers are my eyes. And he said, I now run my fingers through my hair. So he said, you've no idea how good that feels. Wow. So there is a tactile component to it as well. That's really interesting in terms of the gentleman you spoke of who, who had no sight in terms of the feel of his hair. Yeah. And again, it's, it's hard to escape the, the mental image or the visual image that would have conjured up not only the sensory image, because... Yeah. I mean, the building that you're working out of in Black Rock is called Samson House. Um, so, you know, if you think about it, there's a, I don't know, is that an intentional uh, dark humor for you? I, I'm not sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Very few people actually pick it up. But when we moved in here 12 years ago, I wanted to give it some sort of title. And um, we, we thought Samson would be appropriate because of the strength. And uh, for those patients who don't pay their bills, uh, Delilah is in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> she, well, she collects the bad debts. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe that's, a, that's an episode for another podcast in terms of what goes down in the basement in, uh, in HRB. Or, I'm only joking. Well, I, we'll take your word for it. We, um, but I guess it's really interesting, I think, because I know personally, having been through 
to treatment with yourselves um, initially presenting as someone who was concerned about losing their hair and then taking the step to actually undergo a surgical procedure. I did feel that it was vanity. So why isn't it vanity? For you, from all the patients you've seen and you've been at this for 20 years, for you, it's not vanity. It goes more than that. Yeah, this, we all have a little bit of vanity, but it's not the primary thing. And when patients come back to me with their hair treated, either surgically, medically, or a combination of both, um, their friends tell them they look well, they look healthy, they've lost weight, and they look younger. And I'm sure you've had a bit of that experience. And the patients themselves say, say uh, I have a sense of contentment. I feel better about myself. Um, but it's never about my appearance. It's the, the appearance never comes into the scenario. Self-esteem, self-confidence, contentment, and peace of mind. I hear that all the time. Really? Yeah. I had a patient um, this morning, and we went into Google, and I put in hair loss treatment into Google, and I'm just looking at the screen, and there's 1.44 billion results on Google for hair loss treatment. So that shows you that the snake oil salesmen are out there yeah. preying on the vulnerability that hair loss can cause. Yeah. And to me, that says it all. When there's 1.44 billion results for a search on Google, there, there is no cure for it. And trying to meet a patient's expectations is one of the key things I do at the uh, initial consultation. And how do you, so how do you meet, how do you manage not only meet, but manage someone's expectations? Because if, if it runs as deep as, as you're clearly saying that it does, I imagine some of those expectations are pretty high. It's almost a psychological assessment. Um, a lot of guys would just come in and say, look, I, my hairline is flying back. I don't see a bald man in the mirror. What can we do about it? And I go through the various options with them and they, they will either press the button then or press it later on. I had a patient last week who we operated on. We did three and a half thousand grafts, but he first came to see me 18 years ago. So it took the man 18 years to make up his mind to go ahead and have the hair transplant. Wow. Isn't that amazing? That is incredible. This this man came in, is 92, um, dressed beautifully, uh, immaculate suit, uh, but he was worried about his future hair loss at the age of 92. So the concerns about hair loss that men have, it never goes away. The 20-year-olds the think when they're 30, they'll be fine. The 30-year-olds when they're 40, et cetera, et cetera. I had a man in this week, 75, and he's just booked in to have a hair transplant carried out. So At 75? What, yeah. And I'm 74 this year, but my mental age is the very same as when I left school. So to me, the body ages. You can accelerate that with a bad diet and bad lifestyle, or you can slow it down with a good lifestyle and, and keeping your body healthy. But you can't stop aging. And hair loss ages you prematurely when you see it in the mirror. A lovely example of that. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, Tiger Woods won the Masters, and the old Tiger was back, iconic. Sunday afternoon, the red shirt, the black cap, sank the putt, the crowd went wild, and then he took his hat off to shake hands with his opponent, and this old man appeared out of nowhere. Yeah. He'd gone bald the intervening years mm. from his startup days. Um, and it really was iconic, yeah. the effect of hair loss. And even the commentators on the TV said, Tiger, put your hat back on. Really? Wow. Some of my patients, um, uh, actually golfers, they, they won't take the hat off on the 18th green because of their hair loss. Yeah. I have some very famous um, you know, musicians and actors who wear baseball hats or various uh, scalp coverings. And when they come to the passport control at the airport, it's a huge deal for them to actually take the hat off for wow. the um, passport inspection. So the, the psychological impacts are enormous, absolutely. But it, it seems almost, because you've been doing this a long time, you've been doing it for 20 years, you were a pioneer in many ways. Um, because in, you, in Ireland, I certainly was. In Ireland, yeah. you certainly were, and you've clients from all over the world. But... You know, online, I've seen some of your clients speak publicly to some of the the very good kind of video documentaries, very short documentaries you guys, you guys do about people talking about their experience. And when I listen back to those and I think of my own experience, it goes almost to an existential place um, in terms of 
reminding us of our mortality, and this affects women too in, in a different way and, and slightly later in life, as I'm assuming, but this seems to affect us in terms of reminding us of our mortality, reminding us, uh, it, it's more existential because as you have often, I've heard you say, nobody ever will die from this condition. Nobody will, you can live, shave your head or do whatever you want to do, psychologically make a decision. This is it, I'm done, I'm moving on. But for so many people, that seems to be just a corner they can't get around. And, and it, it, it worries a lot of them that they are concerned about their hair loss. I had a, a surgical colleague and he said, Morris, this thing is doing my head in. He said, I'm a bright, intelligent, well-qualified doctor. And he said, I don't understand why this thing is affecting me the way it is. And, you know, if I meet a patient whose expectations I can't meet, I send them to a psychologist. Really? I, I had a young man recently and he's hell bent on having a hair transplant and it's the last thing he needs. It really is the, his response to the medical treatments we have him on has been superb. He doesn't look as if he's any hair loss at all, but in his mind, his hair loss is deeply disturbing to him, even though it's barely visible. So the, the psychological elements of this are huge. And it worries me greatly that so many young men are heading off to Istanbul and other places like that, and they're getting mutilated. And we're getting three and four um, phone calls a, a month now at the moment for repair work. Um, I had a 25, 25-year-old woman rang me from London yesterday, and she had big plug rafts put in along her hairline in Turkey, um, like the old clumps of hair. And she's only 25, and they've lowered her hairline in a ab grossly abnormal way. And the poor woman is so, so upset. All she wants to do is go back to where she was. So, um, so she's gladly, she gladly take her old self back following 100%, this. 100%. So, Morris, why is that? I can understand. Is it, is it because of the availability of a cheaper option now in, in Istanbul, which is kind of well known as, as an alternative for a variety of reasons, mainly because it seems to be cheaper than, than the more established outlets? Or, and is it because image, body image in particular with the rise of social media has meant that young people have this, you talked about expectations, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't just put young people in that category. We all seem to have be reminded on a daily basis of what beautiful and what healthy and what a Samson or a Wonder Woman character looks like. Yeah, we, we, we live in a much more visual world than I grew up in. You know, at, at election time, um, there were no pictures on the ballot papers. There were no uh, posters on the lampposts and the bridges. Just a name. And now, if you look at those at election time and study them, there's very few men with, or women with hair loss. It's almost like there's a pre-selection. Yeah. At the age of 60, half the male population of the world are losing their hair. Yeah. And it's men that I primarily deal with although we do treat women as well, but our conversation is going to be biased towards men because they're the majority of my patients. But it, it, it's, it's really intriguing. Um, a guy named Thomas Cash a number of years ago did um, psychological studies on hair loss um, back in the 70s. But he showed photographs of young men with varying degrees of hair loss to young ladies and say, well, who would you fancy going out on a date with? And I'm afraid balding guys didn't do well at all. Yeah. And likewise, in job selection, there's a, um, a bias against baldness. It's really? Illegal. It shouldn't be like that, but it is. So if ever I write a book now, I was going to call it Hair Matters. Yeah. Well, it'd be as good a title as any. A play on words, but um, in, for the person in the mirror, it, it really does matter. And then you have people who I never see <clears throat> who will shave their head and accept their hair loss and get on with their life. And I can't think of anybody better than and, uh, Andre Agassi, the That's tennis right. player. That's right. Um, really, really good bone structure, beautifully shaped bone structure in his head, shaved head, but really dark eyebrows. Yeah. And eyebrows give your face uh, definition and expression. And I can't see anybody uh, looking better with a shaved head and Sinead O'Connor when she shaved her head is stunningly beautiful. Now, I remember growing up as well, the only guy I remember on TV having a bald head was Kojak and he looked amazing. 
um, Bruce Willis yeah. later on in, in later life. But if you look at Bruce Willis, his eyebrows are very, very poor. Eyebrows can sometimes be affected by the balding process. And if you compare Andre Agassi and Bruce Willis side by side, which yeah. I've done mm. at a lecture, um, they, the um, Andre Agassi went out all the time. So yeah. <laughs> I, I had an amazingly bald man years ago. He had very little donor hair at all. He wore a wig and he wanted to get rid of it. But his eyebrows were non-existent. And he had enough hair to do an eyebrow transplant. Right. So he grew a little smeg. We gave him the eyebrows and he took the wig off and everybody told him he looked stunning. Wow. Wow. Because they were aware of the, the wig. And if I was to give any advice to anybody is don't ever wear a wig. Don't do a comb over and don't have a bad hair transplant. They're, they're socially unacceptable. Yeah. People, people don't mind bald men. They, they subconsciously, they'll be critical of them. But at a conscious level, if you go to see your lawyer or your accountant, you're not going to be critical of their baldness. It's the, it's the person. We go back to the guy in the mirror all the time. Yeah. It's the image we it's have. Self. It's the image we have of ourselves. Is that we all have a noise in our head in terms of the story about the world we see and the, and how we interpret that and the noise we had in our head on our head that justifies how we move through it. But as you as you, I think as we've spoken about and as you rightly mentioned, it's the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror, the, the image looking back of us. If that doesn't match how we've always seen ourselves. Like you mentioned Tiger Woods. When we think of Tiger Woods, we think of the fist pumping in the air, the red on a Sunday, absolutely dominant. Yeah. And I do remember when he took off that hat. Um, I do remember seeing God Tiger is like the rest of us. He's human. He's, he's frail. He's mortal. When I think of the, 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 the men that I admired, you know, in sport, Ayrton Senna had this beautiful, you know, Brazilian long flowing locks. JFK was always a fascination for me as a political figure. Again, perfect hair. His hair is timeless. It looks good in the 60s. It looks good now. Um, and I, I mean, I remember my own father, he, who's someone I've always admired. He lost his hair really young. And I do remember as a young man seeing him seeing his image back. For, this is when I was really young and it really stuck me. And that kind of discontentment, I, could, I, could re I recognize it now. I didn't at the time. But the, he, the image he had himself as a young, virile sportsman wasn't the image that was looking back. And it's something that shouldn't be played with. That's one of the reasons I agreed to talk to you is that I, I really have deep concerns about these hordes of young men who are heading off abroad for the, to get the hair done and they think it's a one-off treatment and their hair loss won't progress. Um, I just had a patient earlier this morning. He's had two transplants done, one in London, one in Spain. And... Um, Nobody thought of uh, offering the medical treatment, so his hair loss has progressed onwards. Most of the men in his family were shiny bald, and his his initial response to his hair transplant, which he was quite happy with initially, um, is now gone because his native hair is disappearing. So it's the management of the patient throughout their whole lifetime of hair loss that's critically important to, uh, particularly in young men. And I've I've had. Some young men, in as young as fourteen, who have started to lose hair. Wow! Imagine fourteen years old. It's incredible. The worst I've ever seen a seventeen-year-old. Um, at the age of fourteen, he started, and by the age of seventeen, the top of his head was virtually bald. It was the fastest I've ever seen. Yeah. So, when you're when I'm seeing a patient or any of my doctors here, we're assessing the patient and their needs now, but we have to project forwards. Because the surgeon's motto is, first, do no harm. But my very first day in surgery, I was told, make the patient better or I'll leave them the same, but never make them worse. And so the capacity to do a botch job on hair yeah. is enormous. It looks so easy. And I'll, yeah. I remember my first transplant. I saw it in Paris over 20 years ago. And I thought, my God, this is money for old rope. Really? But, but when I... I didn't do a transplant for five years. I was away training and I was a fully qualified surgeon. I then realized how difficult it is to manage patients' expectations. And technically, it's a very uh, technical operation, but that, that can be mastered by anybody with competency. But the management of the patient's expectations um, over their lifetime is one of the key elements to this. 
and it's just not being done anywhere. When there's a discomfort with anything in our life, though, Morris, we want we want it to be over really quickly. And maybe, obviously, I hear that concern from you about young men who are who are maybe thinking this is a silver bullet and I get this once and it's two grand and I'm done. But I guess what I'm hearing from you is that your hair is a moving target. Your body is aging all the time. Our body is shifting all the time. And that I know I've been a patient of yours for a decade. I'm sure you have patients from the day you opened your door that it's a continual process throughout your life. And we all have to accept at some point that we are going to age. We are going to get older. And that guy looking back is going to be very different. It's probably going to be your father, or your mother looking back at you. That's we're all going in that direction. Right. And it's kind of that accept knowledge first in that education, as you mentioned, and, and there's an acceptance element to that too. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've accepted my aging. I, I'm very comfortable in my own skin because I've kept my hair. I, I always say I picked the right parents, and that's very important to do that. Um, but I, I use a little bit of um, a drug called minoxidil, which is the active ingredient in Regain. And I've been taking a tablet version of that for the last two years. And your hair ages as you get older. And mine was getting finer, but I wasn't going bald. And um, my hair is much, much stronger now. And I'm really happy with it. You know, yeah, yeah. Even on a personal level, um, I'm benefiting from an improvement in the appearance of my hair. Even though it's no white, um, patients are telling me, gosh, Morris, you haven't aged in 10 years. And it's the hair, the hair that does it. I have some fascinating stories. What comes to mind there is a young man in his 20s. He's married and has two kids. And his wife has never seen the top of his head. What? He wears a baseball hat all the time, even in bed. And when he came to see me, he wouldn't take the hat off for me to examine his scalp. That's how traumatized he was by his hair loss. Because most, most young men coming to me um, were able to treat them medically rather than going down the surgical route. Um, but unless you have that awareness of the potential psychological impact of the hair, you can do an enormous amount of damage to the patient. And the commercial clinics are run by salesmen. They're, you meet a salesman in the clinic. You don't meet a doctor. And to me, this is of such high importance that it's as serious as any medical condition anybody can have. And it's interesting. We're allowed to keep our uh, clinic open during COVID, wow. because we've we've allowed we've uh, a lot of patients who are on serious medications. But this is to me is not primarily a cosmetic process. It's much more than that, and that's really why we're talking. So, for you, it's a much more. It's there's a wider process. The procedure or the treatment is only a small part of that. It's it's staying close to the patient and making sure that. That I, what I hear from you is they have to be in the right headspace in order for, for you to be able to help them, for, first and foremost. Yeah, my, my patient this morning, I said, look, the last thing you need is a hair transplant. Um, I may do one on you sometime, but I said, we need to get your hair loss under control first and then manage your expectations. So I said, um, until we achieve that, I said, I'm not going to do a hair transplant on you. I said, yeah. commercially, it would be very much my interest to do it, but it is not the correct thing for you medically. And he was deeply appreciative of what I had said to him. Um, I had a man from Spain a couple of years ago, and um, he was losing hair. And we were about a half an hour into the consultation. And he said, Morris, can you give me back a full head of hair? And I said, absolutely not. Nobody can. He said, it's not possible. We can't generate new hair in a laboratory. OK, he said, I'm going to stop the consultation here. He said, I'm really appreciative of what you just told me because he said that's what I want I want a full head of hair back and he said I was told by two clinics in Europe that they could give me a full head of hair but I didn't believe them so he said I've traveled from Spain to hear you say those words to me wow and he said I'm deeply appreciative and he said if ever I do have a hair transplant I'll come back to you and has he been back no he hasn't no so he had to go around, what I hear there, he had to go, on, go around Europe for someone to tell him like it was. Because he, he realized it himself, but he wanted to hear the words from somebody with some sort of professionalism about them. The shysters and the salesmen were telling him everything that he wanted to hear. And I often say this to a patient, I said, my job is to be understanding of the concerns you have, but to be absolutely honest, 100% honest with you. And I said, I have to tell you the things that you need to hear, not that you want to hear. 
Yeah. I said, the salesman will always tell you what you want to hear. And that's the difference. So my advice to young men, and this is one of the reasons why we're chatting, is for God's sake, get one or two or three consultations with a competent clinic, no matter where you live in the world, and think about what your long-term goals are, not just your immediate. Um, Because an enormous amount of damage can be done. And it's very, very difficult to do any sort of repair work on patients um, who've had bad hair transplants done. Really difficult. I, I had a young man who went to Thailand and his hairline was halfway down his forehead and he's now starting to go bald behind it. You know, he's destroyed for life, deeply upset by it. And I said, look, we, we do our best. We can do laser hair removal. But I said, it's never going to be perfect. So for you, it's don't necessarily dive too deep into Dr. Google. If it's if there's a discontentment there, then you need to do your research. You need to, you need to talk to doctors as opposed to salespeople. Yeah, and even the, the medical treatments that we've discussed previously, and I'll, you know, finasteride has been around now for over 30 years, sorry, 25 years for prostate and over 20 for hair. It's been approved by the FDA. We have nearly 15,000 patients taking it on an annual basis, and we review them regularly to renew their prescription. So I'm very comfortable with this medication. But if you went into Google and looked at it, you would think it was poison. So why is that? Look, pharmaceuticals, we all know, have a, a huge influence over all our lives. Um, why, so why has Finastra got a, such a bad rap on, on when you, as you said, if you punch it in and, and do some research? Why does it get such a bad rap? Or is that the way it is with certain drugs? In, in, in the placebo-controlled trials that were done with Finasteride, 3.8% of men who are taking Finasteride will get a sexual side effect either erectile dysfunction, uh, loss of libido, or reduced amounts of semen. But 2.1% of the men taking the placebo got the very same. Ah. So in my experience clinically with over 15,000 patients, those, those findings are what we roughly 98% of, 98 men out of 100 will have no issue with the uh, side effects from the medicines. And of the group that do, once they stop the medicines, their side effects disappear. But when you go online, people are talking about persistent side effects. I've never seen it in 18 years of prescribing this drug. And I still have patient number one. We've over 30,000 patients in our database. And patient number one is still uh, attending the clinic well, 20 years on. If that's not a testament, so, I don't know what is, yeah. So, you know, I, I, it's not that I always say to patients, and I'm sure I've said this to you, nobody's ever died from this condition. Yeah. Nobody needs the medicines and nobody needs a hair transplant. But these are options that we're looking at. And you need to weigh up the options and then decide yourself. And I always say that I'll guide you and make sure you don't make any mistakes. Your family will hopefully support you. But ultimately, if you want to treat your hair loss, it's the guy in the mirror you talk to. And he'll tell you what to do. Nobody else. Absolutely no salesman, no doctor, <laughs> nobody. I'm only one person in a team, Niall, and I want to pay huge respect to my uh, nursing and uh, technical colleagues here and my other doctors who work at the clinic here. Yeah. You know, I'm only the leader, the leader of a team here. It's not just about me. I've, I, I sound as if I have a big ego, but I'm not, actually. I'm very humble. And mm-hmm. surgery makes you very humble. Really? You What's, know, what is it about surgery? Yeah, that? You know, when a few cases go very well, you think you're the greatest thing since fried bread. And then you run into a complication or something and then boom, you're back down to earth. Yeah. So it's a very, it can be a very humbling specialty. Yeah. Well, Morris, I can certainly say my day at, at HOBR was like a spa day and, and, and uh, it was almost like a, a relaxing, the most, one of the most relaxing days I've had, but you have a wonderful team there, very dedicated to their work. And I know that it's very intense work, very painstaking work, physically strenuous work. Um, yeah. And I think it's clear that you have one of the best teams in the world, but you've been very, very generous with your time this morning. Is there anything you want to leave us with? Any thoughts as we, as we come back into the life out of lockdown and, and moving forward? Yeah, I, I always say this. If hair loss is a concern to men, please seek out properly qualified doctors and get good advice from a doctor and then speak to the man in the mirror. Don't rush into a hair transplant. Yeah. Don't rush into it. Yeah. It can be a fatal mistake. Yeah. 
Morris, what gym do you work out at? Because I reckon you know we could we could do a we could do a bench off. Well, it's interesting. I, I there's a CrossFit uh, gym around the corner from where I work. Yeah. But I designed the building that we're in uh, 12 years ago, yeah. and I put a gym into it. Oh wow! All my staff, um, I encourage them to use the gym. Wow. And it, it's obviously incredibly popular at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> so you're certainly practicing so what you I, preach. Yeah. So it, it's been a great uh, bonus to us here over the lockdown. Yeah. And obviously it's only one person at a time and we clean and we do. Of course. I'm totally compliant with the law and the rules. Yeah. Uh, you know, we do antigen testing here on all our staff and our patients. So I, even though I sound a little bit radical and critical, I do comply 100% with what the rules of the uh, government are and the HSC. It's been great to see you, and I genuinely really enjoy that and appreciate your time. Great pleasure, Nathan, and I hope to see you so shortly. Yeah, I look forward Take to care. seeing you in Dublin. How long have you been pumping iron in the gym? Because you mentioned a number there which made me feel very insecure. Um, I'm not sure I'd be like to be, to be deadlifting anywhere near you in a gym, um, but I'd be only looking at my hairline in the mirror anyway, so we wouldn't have to worry. The lockdown was of some benefit. I lifted 147 uh, on Sunday. 147. 147. Anyway, that's by the by. That's not for mentioning. Yeah. That's incredible. 